Hey everybody, starting from today through the rest of July 2021, I'll be making videos as part of a summer series for the Java programming language, filling in content from the AP CSA syllabus that was not covered in my previous videos, and going beyond these outline topics to help provide a stronger and better understanding of the programming language. So, even if you have already taken the AP CSA exam, or are planning to take it this coming school year, or are just curious about Java, hopefully this this series has something for you. For more information about this series and how it aligns with my previous videos and the APCSA syllabus, be sure to check out my website askthecat.org and watch previous CS videos on my APCSA and technology playlists. Today's main topic is going to be about Java classes and object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming, abbreviated as OOP, is at the heart of programming languages like Java, which facilitates the organization of programs in a way that mirrors how objects are organized in the real world. Through an OOP lens, programs are made up of sets of objects that work together in predefined ways to accomplish specific tasks, like how individualized and separate Lego bricks can be stacked together to create a castle. While such a construction may seem at first difficult, once you know how each object interacts with each other and what their individual function is, creating such a system becomes progressively easier. An object can be defined as a self-contained element of a computer program that represents a related group of features and is designed to accomplish specific tasks. Our classes in Java acts as a template or a blueprint to create multiple objects with similar features. Classes embody all features of a particular set of objects. When you write a program in an object-oriented language, you don't define individual objects. Instead, you define classes of objects. For example, you might have a car class that describes features of all cars, having at least four wheels, at least two doors, seat belts, etc. The car class serves as our template, our abstract model for the concept of a car. But to actually have an object that you can manipulate and use through our program, we need to have a concrete instance of the car class. Therefore, if our classes are used to create objects, we can then work directly with the objects to create variations of the types, like customizing our car to have a specific paint job, specialized interior design, and specific branding. Although each of these car objects differ from each other, they still have enough in common to be immediately recognizable as related objects. In a practical Java project application, you can also use such classes to create a command button, dialog boxes, and other interactive programs. Fortunately, each version of the Java language includes a group of classes that implements most of these common and basic functionalities in groupings called class libraries. The standard Java class library already contains dozens of classes. In fact, oftentimes when you refer to using the Java language, you're actually talking about using the Java class library and the keywords slash operators that are recognized by the Java compiler. For more complicated Java programs, you might create a whole set of new classes with defined interactions between them. These could be used to form your own class library for use later in other programs. Such reuse is one of the fundamental benefits of OOPS and is why OOPS languages are really popular to use and implement. Generally, every class you write in Java is made of two components. The first are our attributes. Attributes are the individual things that differentiate one class of an object from another and determine the appearance, state, and other qualities of that class. Think the car brand, car color, car features, and car acceleration. Within our classes, these attributes are defined using variables. But since each object can have a different value for its variables, we call these specialized values instance or object variables. Therefore, the object's class defines what kind of attribute it is, but each instance stores its own value for that attribute. However, there are also class variables, an item of information that defines an attribute of an entire class. This variable applies to the class itself and to all of its instances, so only one value is stored no matter how many objects of the class have been created. The second component of our Java classes is its behavior. Such behavior determines what objects of that class do to change their own attributes, and how they react when another object asks them to do something. This behavior is dictated through methods. The previously made getter and setters video had detailed two types of methods that can control and change how variables are made and what their values are. But there are methods that can also make changes and dictate the behavior of other classes and objects with some objects using these methods to communicate with each other. 
It's like having a method that allows a car to have a horn that is pressed any time another car is about to crash into it, notifying the other car to step on its brake. And just as there are instance and class variables, there are also instance and class methods. Instance methods are the most common type, and they apply slash affect only the object of a class, while any class method would affect the entire class. Using the same scenario as before, a class method would be like having a braking functionality for all our cars, since the action of braking is necessary for all manufactured cars. But an instance method would be the reaction time of each brake, with older car objects, for example, having slower times due to wear and tear on the braking mechanism, with newer cars being more reactive and more likely to stop sooner. Now let's look at an example of the class constructions. To create a class, we have to use the basic class definition, which uses the keyword class. Here we have a class called main. Note how our dot Java file and our class name are the same. Now, if we were to create instance variables for this class, we could define them right here, simply inside the curly braces. We will create three instance variables, string color, string car brand, and int max passengers. Remember that these variables allow us to fulfill the attributes requirements for our class. These variables will be used to describe our specific car objects, but before we create these objects, let's make sure we fulfill the other requirement for creating classes, adding behaviors. To do so, we need to create some methods. The first is going to be show attributes, which is going to return to the user information about the car object that we will be creating. Note that we are using the void modifier because we are not returning a value, only printing out a statement. The public modifier is not necessary in this method declaration and is not included because we can assume that all methods will be public, helping avoid redundancy throughout the rest of our code. Now let's say that we want to change the color of our car and its maximum number of passengers to a default setting for all car brands. We can use setter methods to do such a task. The first setter method will change the color of any car to the default color black. The second setter method will change the maximum number of passengers for any car to only four. Now that we've finished defining these behaviors, we can create an instance of our class, aka our object, within the main method. To do so, we use the following line of code. The term example1 and example2 refers to the name of our first and second object respectively, with main being the name of our class. You can name your object to anything that you like. Just make sure it falls in line with the Java naming conventions. We define the instance variables for each object in separate lines, using the dot modifier to specify which variable we are defining. We can double check that these variables are set to the following values for each object by calling on the show attributes method we previously defined, written out like so. Now let's say we want to change our example two car to its standard attributes. We can do so this time by calling the setters method only for example two, like so. If we were to call on the show attributes method again after such changes, we see that example two's characteristics have changed the default values we chose, while example one's characteristics have stayed the same. In today's video, we learned how to organize programs into elements called classes, how these classes are used to create objects, and how to define and construct these classes by two aspects of its structure, how it should behave, and what its attributes are. Next week, we will look at how we can connect classes to each other and the way that one class inherits functionality from another class. Hope this helped!